Randy Hudgens, head football coach at Columbia City High School in Columbia City, Indiana. We play in the 4A classification. I'm proud to represent our program in the Northeast Hoosier Conference. Um, what I'd like to talk about in this installment is practicing the passing game. Essentially, if you don't watch anything else that I talk about, this would be a very good one for you to take a look at because a lot of people look at the spread offense, see all these teams, the Indianapolis Colts, and uh, a lot of the spread teams in college run this and think, oh, we can do that, just line up and run those plays, and uh, you know, we'll put 400 yards up and 40 points up. The passing game is something that must be perfected, the timing, the execution, uh, the synergy between the quarterback and the receiver. And uh, so this is our attempt to try and get ourselves ready for Friday night. A lot of these ideas, I had to go around different colleges and just kind of work, see what works best for our schedule and our situation. And I, I uh, encourage you to do the same with how many coaches you have, how many players you have, uh, what your talents are and abilities for your program are. Now, I'd just like to start with a couple thoughts on just the spread offense and things I picked up, and then we'll get into what we do on a weekly basis from a practice schedule standpoint. Uh, one of the things I want to start off with, and I got this from the University of Toledo, who got it from Larry Karras at Mountain Union, players, formations, and plays. Uh, you first want to look at, whenever you're designing a passing attack, look at the players that you have. They all have strengths, they all have challenges, and so you want to design those things built around the players. Formations would be your next thought. Many ways you can formation your way into having an advantage, especially in the passing game. You see this in the NFL and even now in the college game. Then getting to certain plays that will work. And so if this is your progression, as you design the offense throughout the offseason, you go, go to colleges or you go to other high schools, this is a very good approach that I've found has worked for us. Uh, execution over scheme is very important. You can have the 10 best pass plays, but they're not going to matter if you can't execute them. A lot of the times as coaches, we think that scheme can overcome the weaknesses of our players. It usually doesn't work that way, and all of us that have run the spread offense or any type of offense have usually found that out the hard way. Player strengths and limitations have to be at the forefront of what, how you design your package. You might want to throw the ball 50 times a game, but if you have a big offensive line, not a lot of receivers, and a quarterback that doesn't throw the deep ball very well, then your future might be in running the football. In our spread offense, we have run the football 40, 50 times a game in certain situations uh, because that's what the defense gave us and that's what was working that particular night. So you've got to be flexible. Training or timing and confidence. In the passing game, it takes just as much time, if not more, uh, to, to perfect things and to get things running uh, smoothly. Uh, with timing and confidence. A lot of this we build throughout the seven on sevens throughout the, uh, throughout the summer. I don't, you know, if you're in a different state, then your rules might be different here in Indiana. We're able to spend a lot of June and July at different seven on seven events, which obviously without the linemen, you lose a few things, but also for quarterback and receiver, timing and confidence is absolutely essential. And throughout the week, you have to give them opportunities to work certain routes. So those are some of the things that we start from when we design our practice plan. This past season, what we settled into um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, I think was a critical part of our success. So, and hopefully you can read my handwriting. Um, first of all, Mondays, and, we, and a lot of this isn't different than what you might do. Maybe a few things we do differently. A lot of them we picked up from some pretty smart people. We go over a scouting report and film of our upcoming opponent. We usually take a good 50 minutes or so in order to do that. We usually try and have our JV guys in with that, even if we have a JV game on Monday so that they can get that. Um, the scouting report will introduce the basic schemes and adjustments. We keep our scouting report, offense, defense, and special teams, eight pages or less. Let's face it, in this day and age, our guys, we're lucky if they read that. Quarterback, um, you know, when we go out on the field, uh, we have more of a defensive individual period, but usually I'm able to take the quarterbacks with me and just work certain fundamentals, whether it's, you know, uh, working drops, we work uh, catching and throw, which is basically catch, throwing to receiver as quickly as possible, getting the laces, getting the, getting the feet and hips turned, and, and looking at the mechanics. Uh, we, we have a throwing net that we hang up from one of the goal posts, and this is a really good investment for you. Most places you can get it for less than $200. Uh, it has different pockets for the quarterback to throw to. Uh, with that, we work pass under pressure, which very simply, we either put two guys and simulate a rush up the middle or two guys and simulate a rush on the outside. He's got to step up. He's got to move in the pocket and throw. Uh, you can also work your rollout technique. So that's an invaluable resource where you don't have to really chase the football. Um, and so we're able to do that, usually at the quarterback, usually about 10, 15 minutes. 
After that, we get the whole offense together and we run our 11 openers for that Friday night on air. It's the first time we really introduce our opening 11 plays. As coaches, I try and kind of sit down, you know, see what we want to do that week, see what we think will work, see what we anticipate the opponent doing, and then uh, make a group of 11 openers to go with that. Every coach that does this has different numbers of plays that they do for openers, some 5, some 20, some 10. We settled on 11 because the first time we did it, I put 10 in and our offensive line coach wanted an extra running play, so it became 11. But 11, we do it on air to start with. We slow it down a little bit. By the end of the week, on Thursday, I time it, and I, we like to get our 11 plays in in about three and a half minutes. This gets us also to simulate our tempo in the no huddle offense, especially if we're trying to go very fast and it just helps our guys think much quicker as well with their assignments and adjusting to the defense. You always in practice obviously want to create a situation where it's faster and more difficult, more challenging than it will be in the game, so the game seems slow to them. Um, and so after that, we usually line up uh, visually what we expect to see coverage and front-wise and do corrections from the previous week and adjustments. We've gone over it with the, when we've gone over the scouting report. Now we go over it on the field, walking through it, making sure those are ingrained in their heads. Next, we go into, we break the receivers and quarterbacks off from the running backs and linemen. The linemen go ahead and work on pass protection adjustments, uh, different blitzes that they'll see, different fronts that they'll see. And the great thing about the spread offense is by about week five, you've seen every defensive look that you're going to see all year. So from then, it's just rep recognition and repetition. We do one-on-one -on -one routes. We like the quick game on Monday. A lot of times there's press coverage, which most teams, if they have good athletes, they're going to just get in press coverage and dare you to get them out of it. And so you always have to have an answer for that. Our answer is by teaching our guys how to release. Because if you beat press coverage, they're in trouble. But if you don't, then you're in trouble. So we work the slam routes and the hitch routes. We also work the whip routes with the A's and B's, which I'll talk about later, basically working inside, pivoting, and working back outside. Works very well on the goal line. Pivot, which I'll talk about in the rollout scheme as well. If you ever saw um, the 49ers and the Cowboys in the NFC Championship game in 1981, Dwight Clark the catch, that's the pivot route. That some people call it the sprint right option. Uh, arrow routes, that quick out route right on the goal line for a first down. Um, and some other things just depending on how much time we have. Usually we only have our top two quarterbacks with this. If you have a luxury of having four really good quarterbacks, then you want to do this the whole field. We usually will work a right side, then a left side, and then have the quarterback switch but keep the receivers in the same spot. This is also time if you're putting in a couple new routes, you might want to work your timing on this against air and not really worry about the one-on-one -on -one routes, especially later in the season when you're putting in special adjustments for the playoffs. This might be your time to put those in. Early in the season, when you're just working your base passes, then you're going to want to work your short game and timing with the quarterbacks and the receivers. Late in the year, this might be your time for different adjustments uh, that you're going to use for the playoffs. We'll move on into Tuesday. Tuesday is a big defensive day for us. Uh, we're not quite at the point where we have enough numbers to go the same you know, offense and defense simultaneously. We do, however, start off after our individual warm-up with our top 11 openers. This time we add a defense, and we try and go cover two and cover four schemes. If they're more of a cover four team, then that's what we'll show the offense. If they're more of a cover two team, that's what we'll show more of the offense. Uh, if you have, this is also if they try and go like a cover two with man underneath, you might want to schedule in a few plays where they do that. Uh, this is our, we try and pick up the tempo and intensity. Our goal is to get these 11 in under four minutes. Usually we go about the first six or seven down the field, then turn everybody around and go the opposite direction. You want to make sure you get some of your key subs in during this. You don't want all 11. First of all, it's pretty grueling. But second of all, you want to get your backups in, usually after six, seven plays, even a different running back. You want to keep a quarterback the same 11 most like most. Uh, unless you want to use him, a different quarterback in the first 11 in a wildcat type package or what have you. Quarterback individual, usually the quarterback doesn't play a defensive position. This we usually try and work the zone read, uh, cons uh, the zone read uh, techniques and fundamentals. I'll usually be the defensive end and give him the different looks. Plus we also bring in some receivers that aren't involved as DBs, which we have a few of them, and we work a bubble read off of that. One of the best uh, play action schemes you can run out of the spread offense is to work the zone read to one direction then come around to the bubble the opposite and so we work that but the zone read we also usually try and get the receivers to work on their blocking techniques against each other as well 
We usually try and take a couple minutes to bring our running backs down with the quarterbacks um, in order to work screen fundamentals uh, and screen timing and technique. What we try and do is take our extra receivers and use them as the linemen for pressure so the quarterback and running back have to work to find a window together. If we have time, we work individual routes and mostly just timing. The bender is more of a skinny post that we run on our vertical concept where he gets to the middle of the field and work on timing. Uh, you might put trash cans up where the defenders would be and their, and their zone drops for visual uh, purposes. A corner route, maybe a shallow crossing route with any extra wide receivers you have. Usually this is a 10 to 15 minute period, 15 minutes at the beginning of the year, 10 minutes more towards the end of the year. Um, and then basically the rest of the time is special teams and defense. We have a longer defensive uh, period and a short defensive team period. Um, we always have five trick plays or so we carry into every week, and we usually do that at the very beginning of the offensive period. This will probably be the only time we huddle in our, uh, in our team periods because the defense, after a while, they figure out what those trick plays are. This, then we get about five plays with a backup quarterback in so that we get him a few snaps as well. Uh, a lot of times we have a few designated plays that we will run with the backup quarterback if he has to come into the ball game. Um, this year we had this with a sophomore quarterback that we have coming up, and we wanted to get him some plays of the first group and some plays that would set him up for success. But if you have a situation with a backup quarterback, this is a good time to put him in. And then we go to what we call our money plays, things we're looking that we run every week that are bread and butter. We usually run about 10 of them. That's about 20 plays with our no huddle scheme. Hopefully we, we strive to get through that in about 15 minutes, uh, sometimes longer, sometimes not. That's our Tuesday. Wednesday is more of our offensive emphasis day. Our offensive emphasis day, we go with our individual period, and then we blow the whistle, top 11 openers versus a, a cover one or a cover three look. Even if we're not playing that the, during the week, some teams will show something against a certain opponent we see on film, and they'll come out in something completely different. And we had that this year with a 4-3, cover two, cover four team, that all of a sudden came out in 3-5-3 three, three with a cover three and cover one. So we practice that every week, so we're used to it. Because really, there's only these are the two different types of co set of covered shells that we'll see. We go with a longer offensive individual period. At the beginning, we go with center quarterback exchange, both under center. Really, the only time we go under center is short yardage or for a quarterback sneak. But you must practice that because a lot there are you know you and you'll see it even in the pros when a, when a traditional shotgun quarterback goes under center, they sometimes struggle. And then we'll work the gun. I ask my quarterbacks to work their quick passing uh, feet and uh, feet fundamentals in terms of getting their feet, getting their hips at the target, work their deep passing drop, which is more of a three-step drop, work their steps on inside running plays, uh, work all of those. We ask the centers also to work their, their steps on whether they're zone stepping to the right, zone stepping to the left, pass protection to the right, pass protection to the left. If you can, try and put someone in front of the center and you'll be amazed at how their snaps go. You, but you want them to be trained in that. Usually that takes us three to four minutes. Just tell your offensive line coach and you borrow these guys three to four minutes. Then we, uh, uh, for the next part, for the next about five minutes, we try and line up two receivers and work reads on the slant, working, reading the flat defender, having two receivers and going. You can have backup quarterbacks or wide receivers that might not be involved or what have you. We work our smash concept, which we call scat. We work vertical, particularly if you want to work them reading the free safety and throwing opposite. Uh, you can get extra backup quarterbacks or freshman receivers or what have you. We sometimes will go to the net, but we usually end up our offensive individual with handoffs with the running backs for five minutes. We'll work the zone read to the right or with the zone read to the left. We'll work the option. Uh, sometimes we'll even work our under center eye formation, short yardage running plays. Um, so all of that we get done in our individual. We try and make it as regimented and scheduled as possible. We go into an inside drill after that. We do some special teams as well. The inside drill we have for our five offensive linemen, our quarterback, and our running back, and we try and script all of those so we go at a very quick tempo and get plays in. We'll take our backup quarterback and send him an inside run. Our first team quarterback will do one-on-one -on -one goal line routes with the wide receivers. We start, and for this, you need to really make sure that you put – cones where the 10 yard line is, five yard line, three yard line, and then where the end zone is so that they have something visual to go for. At the 10 yard line, we work fades for the outside receivers, corners for the inside receivers, really working on timing. 
you want to do this against a defender. Now we spread it out, all four guys, or two outside or two inside and a quarterback in the middle. Go one to the right, then turn around, go one to the left. Usually your DBs are probably freshmen or JV players. It really doesn't matter. You, the whole key is they're having to go against a defender instead of just going on air. Uh, tell those guys to hold the heck out of them and you know, mug them if you need to because that's what they need to get on game. That's what they'll see on game day sometime. From, then we'll move to the five yard line and we'll run a comeback route. We'll run two or three reps. And usually try and get this to your top two guys in most cases. Um, or you might run a varsity side and a JV side and switch halfway through. But you don't want to try and get every single rep for every single kid. You really want your top two or three guys getting four or five reps on each of them. We'll run the whip route with the inside guys, which is about a five yard route. This way they can focus on running their route just deep enough into the end zone so that they'll be able to score in a game situation. We then move down to the three yard line, work the slant against a bump and run coverage and watch, work an arrow for the inside guy where he's trying to just get, get to that uh, end zone as quickly as possible, probably a rollout situation. You also want to work fade on the goal line because as you get towards the goal, the footwork changes the, and the quickness of the launch point changes for the quarterback. At the time, you probably want to go under center against this just because the quarterback gets the ball quicker and it just hits so quickly. So that's something we start doing towards the end of the year that really helped work that fade on the goal line, which can be deadly if you have the right people to do it. Early in the season, we'll then go to seven on seven. Later in the season, we cut that out because this is pretty tiring, our one-on-one -on -one drills. I forgot to mention halfway through that period, about a 15-minute period, switch your quarterback so your first-team quarterback can work with the lineman on inside run, and your second-team quarterback can come in and work with the first group. That's where we get a lot of our timing and confidence. Throughout the week, this Wednesday one-on-one -on -one period is probably one of the most critical group periods we do outside of our team periods and our, uh, our openers period as well, which we help get our pace down. We do seven on seven, maybe 10 minutes early in the season. Um, that also gives us a chance to work pass protections for the offensive line uh, or work one-on-one -on -one, um, pass rush as well. Um, you might even use this as a walkthrough or a recognition period uh, for you know saying, hey, here's cover two, what are our weaknesses here, what's our adjustments here, just so you can give the linemen some time to work their blitz pickup assignments. We then finish with a long team period. We run our five trick plays, our, our package for a backup quarterback, then go with our money plays, 10 to 15 of them, and then our short yardage package, which we usually run about five to seven of them. That's where we get in an eye formation, under center. But, and you want to have maybe a package of three or four plays, but you never know when you're going to go to them. Short yardage, being backed up, what have you. Finally, we'll go to our third, what we look at on Thursday, Thursday being our final preparation. We'll do our top 11 plays on air and time them. My goal is three and a half minutes, which seems like a very short amount of time, but if you're just moving down the field, it's not so much. That gives us quicker pace and tempo than we'll probably get in the game, but it helps our guys think fast. The faster that we go, the more confident they are. First time we did this, we went to this, this uh, arrangement in the middle of the year. Our first 11 plays, we scored two touchdowns. We're up 15 to nothing. So it really helped, and I think our, our players really kind of caught on with that. We use it this time for situations. We will have a period before we go. Situations are usually at the end. We will have a period when we line everyone up and just kind of go through one more run through of our adjustments. Here's what we'll see. Front, blitzes, coverages. Here's our adjustments. Um, you know, different things that we might go to if they take something away or if they make a certain adjustment. It's always good to make your adjustments before game day. Heck, most of our adjustments we try and make during the summer so that it's an automatic thing that they already know and we can go to in a game. We try and go through all situations on Thursday so they at least have mentally gone through how we're going to react to it. First, we, stay, we just walk down the field and do this. We start with backed up offense from our own minus one yard line. Usually we have a progression of plays that we'll run. This is the play we'll run if we're on the one inch line, usually a quarterback sneak, um, which is also a good time to go on two so you can get a cheap five. Uh, then if we're from the one yard line, here's the play that we'll run. If we're on the three, here's the play we'll run. And maybe here's a pass play or two that we might run if we think that it is advantageous. We then move the ball up to about the 20 yard line and talk about one minute offense. Um, my coaches that I played for in Hanover College, uh, use the term one minute offense instead of two minute offense because their explanation was it only takes one minute for offense to score. We actually were fortunate to have a drive where we started 
uh, we went 60 yards in about 35 seconds at the end of a half, and they really believed in that one-minute offense. They wanted to change it to 30-second offense, but I think one minute is probably about what we usually can do. And with that, we don't really run a lot of plays. What I try and go through are the different rules that, that our guys need to be aware of in terms of what stops the clock, what starts the clock, and emphasizing being up on the line so that we don't have to spike the ball, so we don't have to call a timeout, but so we're also not in a hurry. Doing our fast uh, top 11 on air really helps us with that. But it's important they know the rules, especially receivers and quarterbacks. Then we move up to about the 50-yard line in what we call four-minute offense. Four-minute offense is a term for Bill Walsh and the 49ers for, a, for the offense at the end of the ball game where you're trying to run the clock out. There are rules that go with that as well. We try and tell them. You know, we kind of turn into a, a bit of a, a joke where we say, receivers, your job is to stay in bounds and not fumble the ball lineman. Your job is to get up slowly, and they usually can handle that, and they get a little bit of a laugh out of it. Then we move up to about the 40-yard line going in and go through the last three plays of a half. If we get the ball with 30 seconds left or maybe 15, we got time for three plays or trying to set up a field goal. These are our three plays we go to. We were able to get set up for a field goal and a touchdown in various games this year because of that. This is also a great opportunity to work your Hail Mary pass. Um, it's something you need to work during the week and you need to teach them because you don't just run all the way down the field and three guys stand next to each other. Usually try and get one guy deep to the back of the end zone, one guy to the ball, and one guy a little bit shorter in case there's a ricochet back. And if you want to know how that works, watch the Jacksonville Jaguars and they did that and they were able to win a ball game with it. We then move all the way down to the goal line and one thing I put in at the end of the year, we had a situation where we had the quarterback reach the ball out and have it knocked out before he got to the goal line. So we just talk a minute or so about different things you do on the goal line. As in, if you're going towards the corner, you can reach the ball out and hit the pile on. It's a touchdown. You just have to break, break the plane of the goal line. And if you do reach the ball out, bring it back in instantly so we don't have a risk of a fumble. Usually those are the three things we say. We then go to our two-point plays. Basically, I just line us up and say, here's our two-point plays. The very first two-point play we will run is this play. Um, and this really actually ended up winning us a very important ball game this year because on that Thursday, uh, we were going through this, and I told our players, this, play, this could very well come down to a two-point play at the end of the ball game where instead of us going to overtime, we go for the win. When we get in that situation, here's a play we're going to probably run. We end up running that play, score the two, get out of there with a heart-stopping victory. So it's important that if you're going to run a two-point play, you, they know what play it is. Because it's the end of a game, your adrenaline's running high, if you already know what you're going to run, that's more power to you. We finish up with fast field goal, um, which basically we just run everyone in for the sideline, I count down, this works your kicker, this works your offense, this might win you a ball game as well. Then we have the offense come out for victory formation. I didn't start practicing this till the middle of last year, and we had to put in a victory formation on the sideline when we're up only by three points and we're way back in our own end. So you got to practice this too. It's a good way to end practice. You blow the whistle, everyone comes together. Now, I know that that's a lot of stuff, but I feel that it's very important for you to be very detailed in your preparation. And like I said, to be a good passing team, it takes as much, if not more, timing and uh, preparation in order to see the dividends on Friday night. Thank you.